I want to start out by throwing a statement on the screen as we start a brand new series this morning. And the statement is this. Jesus was not a Christian, and he never called anyone to become a Christian. Nothing like a little controversy to start out with your coffee on Sunday morning, right? Jesus was not a Christian, and he never called anyone to become a Christian. Now, before you storm out of here and say your pastor's not a Christian, sit down, Brenda. It's going to be fine. <laughs> Chill out. What I mean by this is that Jesus literally was not a Christian. This movement, this, this religion of Christianity didn't exist yet. He was a Jewish rabbi, and he had a very Jewish understanding of the world. Now, the reason that I say this, why would I say something like this? Because being a Christian today, here in America, in 2019, means a lot of different things, doesn't it? Like, if you ask 100 different people what it means to be a Christian, chances are you might get 95 different answers from those 100 people. In fact, we live in a world where it's really easy to claim the name Christian and have a life that looks nothing like Christ. We live in a world where it's really easy to fake it. In fact, I brought some stats here a second, because stats are just really sexy and exciting, and everybody loves those. There are over 9,000 different Protestant denominations in the world. 9,000 different Protestant denominations. And if you Group together all of the denominations that claim to name Christian, you have over 30,000. Isn't that insane? 73% of people in America claim the name Christian. 73%. I, I'd argue, and, and research shows this too, that for those of you that have not trusted in Jesus, for those of you that have not put your faith in him, fake Christians may be one of the biggest barriers to you doing that. I mean, we live in a world where it's really easy to claim the name of Jesus and to have a life that looks nothing like it. I grew, I grew up in the church, and I remember uh, I was the kid in elementary school that got, like, the Christian Character Award every single year. Yes, I got beat up all the time as a kid. And uh, I remember I was in this, uh, this thing called Awana. Anybody know what Awana is? Wow, quite a few people. So you wore this, like, little red vest, and you looked super cool. And the whole point of Awana was that you would recite like these Bible verses to an adult leader, right? And so I was just cruising along reciting these Bible verses. I was going to work my way to the giant trophy that you got called the Timothy Award. Nothing sounds cooler than that, right? And so I'm like reciting these verses to my adult leader, and I am just cranking through him, and he's like amazed, and he's like, how are you knowing all these verses like so quickly? And what he didn't know is that my friends and I in the group were actually slipping each other the booklet that had the verses in him. I was faking it. I was faking it the whole time. And yes, I know, I'm saying all kinds of stuff that you're judging me for right now. <laughs> we're all a work in progress, okay? What? Only this, yeah, only this much judgment. Everybody's welcome here, even the pastor, okay? And so, <laughs> the point is, it is easy to fake it. It is really easy to fake it. Jesus himself talked about people who would fake it. He talked about sheep and goats and how on the outside, I don't even have this in my notes, but on the outside they would look the same. Back in Jesus' time, sheep and goats actually looked identical to each other. Through breeding practices and patterns, we can tell them apart pretty easily. But in his time, they looked really close to each other. And he said, you know what? The sheep and the goats, the sheep are the ones that look like me, and the goats are the ones that just claim my name, but whose life doesn't look like mine. Jesus talked about narrow gates. He talked about how not everybody who claims my name will enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus knew. He knew that there would be fake followers. He knew that there would be people that claim the name Christian, but whose life doesn't look like his. And I imagine that some of us might be sitting in this room today, and there's a name that's coming to your mind. Like, blank is a fake Christian, and you snap your fingers like this when you say that. <laughs> or maybe, maybe some of us are asking the question, am I a fake Christian? Maybe some of us are wrestling through that question. This whole series, Field Guide for a Follower, is going to ask this question. What does the real thing look like? 
Because Jesus and Scripture as a whole gives us some really defined markers of what a real, authentic, Jesus-loving follower of Christ looks like. And so that's what we're going to answer in this series. Does that sound good to everybody in here? Awesome. Too bad if it doesn't. Because we're diving in. Uh, if you have your Bibles, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2 through 8 is where we're going to be this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And if you've been with us this summer, you know we've been in a series called Road Trip. Brandon did an incredible job wrapping it up where we follow the life and the writings of Paul. Paul, who has a radical conversion, becomes this Jesus follower and then writes these letters. He plants these churches and he writes letters to them. Well, this is another one of Paul's letters, but we're going to take a different angle on it this morning. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2 through 8 says this, We give thanks, this is Paul writing, We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, Loved by God that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, I love this part, not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake and you became imitators of us and of the Lord for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone before everywhere so that we need not say anything. This church in Thessalonica is the real deal. They are the real thing. Paul uses words like chosen to describe them. This is actually a a word play on the same words that were used to describe the people of Israel. That you are a chosen people. He talks about how they took hold of the gospel with full conviction despite severe suffering. That they were imitators of Jesus and that they were a church, a group of people worth imitating. That they become a model church The start of the gospel is an incredible thing. And the way it moved is absolutely powerful. I brought with me a, a domino here. And uh, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the domino effect before. But basically the domino effect is that you can start with a domino this small. And a domino can knock down another domino one and a half times its size. Okay? So a domino this size can knock down a domino this size and so on and so forth. Well, the domino effect is this idea that you start this small and by 29 dominoes in, you can knock over a domino the size of the Empire State Building. Isn't that insane? And that is exactly how the gospel began. It started with these small groups of people and it exploded. And by this time, what Paul is saying to this church is that the gospel is radiating from you guys. It is setting an example to the churches and the regions around you of what it means to live in the way of Jesus. You guys are not faking it. You guys are the real deal. You are knocking over Empire State Buildings with the gospel. Not literally, because that'd be, that'd be bad. But the gospel is spreading among you. And when I see these words, don't miss this, this is important. When I see these words to this church in Thessalonica, I automatically assume, well, this must have been a church these must have been a group of people that grew up in the church their whole lives. They must have been Christians their whole lives. They must be these like really mature, really bona fide followers of Jesus. Like they were the ones that didn't cheat on their verses in Awana. <laughs> they are the ones that, you know, they're like the homeschool kids that make jeans that go all the way down to their ankles. <laughs> I mean, they're the good kids, right? But here's the reality about this church. Here's what's what's crazy is this church has only been around for just around a year. Like a year ago, they were pagan worshipers. A year ago, they were not followers of Christ. They were not Christians. They are a new group of Christ followers. And I think one of the biggest lies that we believe in the church, and I run into this 
all the time as a pastor, I hear this all the time, is that God couldn't use me because I don't know enough about the Bible. Or God couldn't use me because I haven't followed him for long enough. And here's the first truth that I want you guys to hear and know this morning, is that your knowledge of the Bible, the number of years that you've been a Christian, the amount of noise you make, the number of weeks you attend church, the amount of Christian bumper stickers and Christian memes that you share, those do not equal the real thing. They don't. Can I get a witness in here for that? They don't equal the real thing. They're not bad things. They can be signs of the real thing, but these in and of themselves are not the real thing. And so if you've ever said any of these things, like <laughs> my wife has said these, she's not here and I'm kind of out in her, but she, like seriously, Sam has struggled. She led a group of students for nine years, this group of girls. And I remember when she first jumped into student ministry, she was like, man, Brad, I don't know a lot about the Bible. And I'm like, but you know how to be present with students. You know how to love them. And you're hungry to grow in your own faith. That's what it takes. And so I want you to hear this morning that if you've only been a Christian for a year or less, and you think that there's some barrier to how God can use you, that's not the case with the church in Thessalonica. They're a brand new group of Christ followers, and Paul calls them a model for how to live in the way of Christ. And so if those things are not the real thing, what is it? What is it that makes these people the real deal? Well, we get a hint in Acts 17 when Paul and Silas plant this church. One of the coolest things about the Bible is you can see like, things happening in real time. Acts is the story of this domino effect where this church just explodes and churches are being planted and people are getting saved. And we see this church in Thessalonica get planted in Acts 17. Listen to what happens. So Paul and Silas are there and they're preaching the gospel. And some Jewish and Gentile people receive it, and they trust in Jesus, and others do not. They reject it. And watch what happens in Thessalonica in Acts 17, verses 5 through 8. It says, but other Jews were jealous. So these are the ones that did not receive it. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace. I love that, bad characters. It's like bad hombres or something like that. The, the King James Version literally says some fellas of the lewd variety in it, which is incredible. I love it. So they formed a mob, and they started a riot in the city. This is all happening in Thessalonica. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city official shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world, one version said, these men who have turned the world upside down, I love that, have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. Amen? There is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Looks a lot like this, doesn't it? This gospel, this thing is spreading powerfully from these few believers, these few people who are authentic, real followers of Jesus, and it spreads like crazy. I love how it says it here, that these men, these men who represent Jesus and who are gospel bearers, they're causing trouble all over the place. Paul says it to the, the church in Thessalonica, like, this thing is spreading from you. Like, regardless of who you are or what you believe, you cannot deny that this thing is causing great havoc in the traditions and the ways of the society. That it's exploding. That something incredible and beautiful is happening in this church. And so what... What is it that makes this church in Thessalonica the real deal? Well, I think for some of us, following Jesus is a matter of saying this prayer and then kind of going about our lives in a way that doesn't look that much different than before. You know, maybe we'll post something about it on Facebook and maybe we'll get a little grief from a coworker, but not much else changes when we follow Jesus. I want you to understand what it meant for a person in Thessalonica to put their trust in Jesus. What it meant is that in many cases, you were plunging your family from prosperity into poverty. 
Because in order to do commerce in this world, you had to hail Caesar as God and as Lord. And to reject that and to say, no, there is another one. Jesus is Lord, meant that you in many cases lost your job. In other cases, it meant your family and your friends disowned you. As we see in Acts 17, it meant getting persecuted. Like real persecution, not the fake American version we make up. Like real, actual persecution. It meant in some cases having your very life threatened. You see... Guys, the gospel, the gospel doesn't lead us to a place of prosperity from the world's standards. In fact, if you ever hear a pastor tell you that the gospel is going to make your life like so good and you'll get rich and God is going to bless you monetarily and all this stuff, they're not reading the same book that I'm reading here. Because what happens in the gospel, what happens when you embody the gospel is that your life actually in some ways goes the opposite way. That in some ways, there's tremendous, Paul calls it severe suffering for the sake of Christ. And if you actually go through the list of what this church walked through, they were rejected by men. They willingly gave up their status in the world. They were mocked and shamed, abandoned by friends. They denied the kingdoms of this world. And man, in that case, you get a real picture of who Jesus is that he is the one who gave up his status for the sake of other people, that he is the one who willingly took on shame, that he is the one who denied the kingdoms of this world and actually ushered in a whole new way of life called the kingdom of God. And this is why the church in Thessalonica is the real deal, because despite what it cost, they were imitators of Jesus. They embodied who Jesus was, what he did, and where he went. And so, I would argue that today we live in a culture of imitation. We live in a culture of imitation and wanting to be like other people. How many of you, just out of curiosity, have ever been annoyed by a millennial in your life? (laughs) Most of us. I'm a millennial in my generation. Drives me crazy. Okay, so one of the most annoying things about millennials, and some of you may not have even heard this, is we have this thing called influencers. And all influencers are is they are people that sit on social media, they have very large followings, and companies will pay them millions of dollars to like wear this t-shirt or try out this lipstick. And my generation comes flocking to try to imitate them and to try to look like them. Do these people have any other other talents that they do? Like are they actors or not? No! They just sit on social media and they just tell people what to buy and people do it. And it is obnoxious. If you're wondering what I'm talking about, think about like the Kardashians. Like, what do they do? Nothing. They don't do anything. They have a reality show and they just yell at each other. But this is what the world of influencers is. In my generation, like, like back in the 90s, you actually had to like do something. Like Michael Jordan was an incredible basketball player. Therefore, he could sell Nike like no other. Like today, you just, you just look cool and people want to be like you and, and you just sell a bunch of stuff. And it is really annoying. I actually, like, full disclosure, just looked at my own Instagram feed and I'm following like four of these people. And so I just unfollowed them this last week so that I didn't make a fool of myself. <laughs> to be fair, I've never bought anything they told me to buy. So there you go. But here's the thing. We live in a world right now that's really confusing. Can we just like acknowledge that it's really confusing and it's frustrating, and we're all navigating together what it means to look like Jesus. And I think sometimes we as the church look at our world and we actually don't know who to imitate in our world. We don't. We don't know who is influencing us. And so what happens is the church lands in a couple different places naturally. On one hand, I think sometimes we try so hard and we actually end up looking a lot like the world that we imitate the world, that in the way we spend our money, in the way we experience greed, in the way we talk to and about each other, we end up actually imitating the world and what the world values and what the world holds tightly to. And on the other hand, I think in some cases, we want to reject the world so hardcore that we end up withdrawing from the world and legitimately hating the world, and we stand on our street corners with our picket signs and our bullhorns, and we just yell at people. My friends, neither of these are the way of Jesus. Neither of these are imitating 
Jesus. Neither of these are what the church in Thessalonica embodied, even despite great suffering and great persecution. And so when we withdraw and hate the world, our testimony is lost. Our hypocrisy is exposed. We end up making a lot of noise and we end up hating the world, like real legitimate hating the world. And I want to reread to you here in 1 Thessalonians how Paul describes this church that is the real deal. Because our gospel came to you, not only in word, but also in power. And in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything." This is powerful stuff. They are living in a world that is far more difficult to imitate Jesus in than the world that we live in today. I mean, we have so much religious freedom that it's possible to build entire megachurches without the power of the Holy Spirit. This might be a little bit too far, but I'm going to say it because why not? Uh, I think one of the best things that could happen to the American church is that we actually lose a little bit of religious freedom. Why? Because we've, we've learned what it looks like to do church without the power of the Holy Spirit. These people are living with no religious freedom, and the Spirit of God is at work so powerfully among them. And I don't know about you, but I am hungry, like legitimately hungry for a powerful move of the Holy Spirit so that he moves so powerfully in the town of Wayland and beyond that we cannot attribute it to anything that we've done. That it's only through him and only through his power that we as a community look exactly like Jesus and this town can't help but notice as a result. Amen. So I want to ask just a couple questions of our church. Can it be said of New Life Church that that group of people looks like Jesus? Can it be said of us that we know how to do community? That we know how to bear each other's burdens? That we're not the type that just signs up for small groups, but we actually devote ourselves to that community. And we show up and we engage and we grow together and we learn together. And we are an Acts 2 and Acts 4 type of church where we're actually devoted to each other. Can it be said of New Life that we know how to do community? That when one of us is in need, the entire church flocks around and take care of that person. That when one of us is hurting and struggling, that they have meals coming out of their ears because we (laughs) we have signed up and want to provide for them. Can it be said of our church that they love their town, that they live with urgency for the sake of other people that are not here right now, that their hearts are broken for lost people in their lives and in their circles, that they are generous with what they have, that they're willing to give and sacrifice on behalf of others. Can it be said of us that we know how to love the outsider, that we know how to love the downcast, the hurting, the widow, the orphan, the doubter, the one who's here this morning and doesn't believe anything that I'm saying? Do we know how to love those people well? Can it be said of us that we know how to worship, that we know how to worship even without a fog machine and crazy lighting, we can still worship Jesus. Because none of those are prerequisites, by the way, for being able to have authentic, real, powerful worship that's full of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I think in some cases, those things maybe (laughs) detract a little bit and distract from that. Man, I want to be a church that is the real deal, the real thing. Can it be said of us that the gospel is advancing from this place like a domino that cannot be stopped. Can that be said of us? Jesus didn't call his followers to just bear the name Christian. He called his followers to be imitators of him, 
to take such hold of the gospel, to take such hold of the, the transformation that he offers, that they are living and breathing imitators and reputation, uh, representatives of him. You see, a person worth imitating is a person who is imitating Jesus. The call of Jesus was not to simply bear the name Christian. It was to bear the lifestyle of a disciple. Jesus invited people to follow him, to be with him, so they could live a life that looks like him. So that they could go where he went, love who he loved, even the difficult ones, especially the difficult ones. That they could do what he did and care about what he cared about. This is the very definition of a disciple. We have a big fancy kind of church word that we call discipleship. And all this means is to be an imitator of Jesus to have a life that looks like Jesus. And Jesus offers us a gift. He offers us a gift called the Holy Spirit who actually empowers us to be able to do this thing of imitating Jesus. And I want to speak to you, if you're here this morning, we've talked a lot about how it's okay not to be there yet and that we're all learning and we're all growing and we're all struggling. I'm still learning what it means to be an imitator of Jesus in my life. I'm learning what it means to be an imitator of Jesus when my kids are pissing me off to no end and just making me crazy. And I think all of us are in this place where we're learning together what it means to imitate Jesus. So here's here's what I would say to, to you. If you want to know what the real thing is, it's a person who is imitating Jesus. Jesus' final words to his disciples were, go into all the world and make disciples, make more imitators of me. The only number that Jesus cares about is disciples being made. He actually doesn't care all that much about how many people are sitting in a service on a Sunday morning if that's disconnected from disciples being made and people growing in imitation of him. That's what he cares about. That was the commission that he gave to his followers. And this is what the church in Thessalonica embodied and so i want you to hear this that that imitating jesus is not a zero to 60 in 2.5 seconds process often it looks a lot more like trudging through the mud with each other leading each other towards what it means to live the way of jesus and to embody him in a world that really does desperately need jesus and who he is amen and so i just want to close here um, with this question. Am I a person worth imitating? Am I a person worth imitating on Monday morning? We all look like Jesus here on a Sunday morning. This is the easiest place to imitate Jesus. But am I a person worth imitating on Monday morning or Friday night or Saturday night? Am I a person worth imitating? Many of you in our church know uh, a man named Doug Mutchler, and I I warned Doug a few minutes ago that I was going to talk about him, and I don't know if he's okay with it, but I don't care. So (laughs) that's bad. Um, Man, I I remember, and, and many of you were here for this, but two days after Doug's grandson was killed, he stood on this stage, and he spoke some of the most powerful words that I've ever heard somebody say. He said, I'm not trying to ask God why. I'm trying to ask God, what are you doing? How are you going to use this? Doug is somebody that I have gotten a chance to witness over and over and over again, and he is someone who is an imitator of Jesus. I I even, like, I read these words when I was studying this week where it says, uh, bear with me a second here, that you received the word in much affliction. That no matter what you're going through, that no matter the cost, that you are an imitator of Jesus. Doug is the type of guy who gives of himself for other people. That if you need a wheelchair ramp built, he will will rally the troops to do that. But he's also a guy that will fiercely fight for people, especially in our high school, who are far from Jesus. This is what it means to imitate Jesus. Like when I look at someone like Doug, I'm like, man, I... Like, like, he's leading me as a pastor into what it looks like to live like Jesus. And I want to imitate that. I want to grow in that. 
And I'm learning from all of you guys. Like this is, a, this is a group of people that knows how to do hospitality really well. That's a biblical kind of sacred practice. That's not not spiritual. That is imitating Jesus when we open our homes and our lives to each other. When we live and we encourage and we challenge each other in love. That is what it means to be an imitator of Jesus. And so maybe you're here and you don't even know how you feel about Jesus this morning. That you are here and maybe you were dragged here by someone else. Maybe you haven't put your trust and your faith in Jesus. And I want to say first to you that we are so glad that you're here. Second thing I want to say to you is that there are a lot of fake Christians out there. There are. And there's a lot of hypocrisy. And there's a lot of people that claim the name Jesus that don't actually embody who he is. And I don't say that statement as like a like an out there kind of condemning statement of those people because I've witnessed hypocrisy in my own life. And all of us have. We're not perfect. We're growing in this. We're learning what it means to be followers of Jesus. But I want to tell you, wherever you are at on your journey right now, know that there are people in this room and in this place that want to journey along with you. And so I have a really, really practical application for you guys today. Like for those of you that are like, just tell me what to do, I have a really clear, this is what you need to do. And so if you look at the way Jesus lived, there are three relationships that he really focused on. He focused on worship, so his relationship with his father. He focused on community, like his relationship with his followers, his disciples, the one that, the ones that wanted to be like him and bear his name. And then he also focused on mission people that were hurting and lost and broken, people that in our day and age here would never step foot inside a church. Those are the three groups and three relationships that Jesus constantly focused on, worship, community, mission. You could say upward, inward, outward, however you want to say it. This triangle is how Jesus lived his life over and over and over again. And I would argue that somebody who is imitating Jesus, just like the church in Thessalonica here, is constantly living in the tension of these three relationships, worship, community, and mission. And so I want to encourage you to over this next semester, like from now until December, to identify what each of these three things means in your life. Maybe for you, like worship has just been like, like man, I have friends, I have community, and I feel like I'm living on mission, but worship is just not there for me. Like I walk into this place and I feel this sense of bitterness kind of raise up in my, my heart or I haven't been in the word of God for who knows how long. And I want to encourage you. There's a bunch of kids walking out right now and I'm like, <laughs> like not one family worth. Okay, sorry, ADD kicking in. Uh, <laughs> your kids are safe, they're good, it's a teacher. Okay, so <laughs> worship. What does it mean? Like maybe for you, that's taken the step to get baptized on October 6th. It's taken that step to go public for Jesus, and that is an act of worship for you. I don't know what it is for you, but take a step forward in worship. Maybe for you, it's, it's community, that you live a life that feels isolated. And there are a bunch of small groups that are starting up in a few weeks from now, and you need to sign up for one. But hear me on this, not just sign up for one, devote yourself to one. Follow through on the one you sign up. Join in in community. Give it a real shot. I was part of a small group that took three years before we really started hitting the, the hard stuff, which is crazy. I don't know why I stuck around for that long. But like it, I remember there was this point where it took time to actually build real, authentic, Jesus-centered community. So maybe for you it's signing up for a small group. Maybe for you it's signing up to lead a small group. And the final one is mission. Next week we have a week called Welcome Home Sunday where we want to welcome our community into this church, where we want to pack out the seats so much in this place not because we care about how many people are in seats, but because you, you have been radically inviting your friends, that you have identified people in your life that need to be here, that need the hope of Jesus, that need the hope of the gospel, and you have invited people to come here. Maybe that's how you're going to live on mission this week, is to invite somebody, 
or to get involved with our new ministry partner, Hand to Hand, which is, which is launching in just a few weeks from now, where we collect food and we give it to middle schoolers in the middle school here in Wayland. April Warren, sorry, I'm putting you on the spot here. April, if you just want to raise your hand, she is leading that ministry for us. And she's already told me that like people are beating down the door to donate food and to help get involved with this ministry. I would love, oh, it's my wife that was leading all the kids outside. I'm so sorry. We need, we need, we're getting barn doors up there next week. So it'll be closed. And yeah, thanks, Steve. And uh, kids walking out the door won't, won't distract the pastor preaching. But uh, man, I need some medication or something. Um, you'll pray for, okay, thank you. Lay hands on me after the service. Uh, but man, guys, I would love if each of us would take some kind of step forward and worship community or mission to put yourself out there, to count the cost that maybe it's going to cost me something to experience these three things. To embody the church in Thessalonica where it said the word of God, the gospel came on these people, not just in their words, but with power and full conviction because of the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what I want to look like as a church. Where people in the football games and in the schools can't help but notice that there is something happening here and it's that there's a whole bunch of Jesus imitators here. Not people that claim the name Christian, but people who embody the way and lifestyle of Jesus. So with that being said, let's go ahead and pray. And then uh, Brandon Sullivan is going to come up and close us. God, uh, I just thank you for what you're doing here, for how you're moving. God, I, uh, I just pray for my friends my brothers, my sisters sitting in this place. God, I pray that you speak to each and every one of them in exactly the way they need to hear from you. God, I pray that, um, that the hurts and the struggles that people are walking through right now, I, God, I pray that you will make your presence known to them, that you will give them a peace that they cannot understand, that you will reveal yourself in power to our church, that we will be a church that is so entirely independent on the work of your Holy Spirit. That we don't build things or try to do things apart from the power that you offer us in your spirit. So God, thank you for how you're moving. Thank you for what you're doing. We love you so much. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, amen. amen.